This is the second part of our discussion about ionic bonding. And we're focusing on the role of energy in the formation of ionic compounds. So in the second video, we're actually going to talk about the Bornhaber cycle. So here we're looking at a Bornhaber cycle that describes the formation of lithium fluoride. Now this Bornhaber cycle looks fairly involved because it has some extra information. Graphics have been provided to depict everything that's happening within the chemical system as you go through various processes. Of course, the overall process that we're interested in is the formation of the ionic compound here, lithium fluoride, starting from the elements. So the overall formation is exothermic, it releases energy. The overall process is here depicted as this step Six. The two scientists, Born and Haber, realized that the formation of ionic compounds can be broken down into the various steps that that chemical system must kind of go through, can be thought of as going through as they go from the form that they're in the elements to the form in which they're in the compound. The depiction here is initially those atoms are in their form as elements. Lithium is in the form of a solid. Fluorine is in the form of these diatomic molecules. And in the final state, those atoms are in the form of the lattice. Lithium and fluoride ions, individual ions, that have packed together to form a lattice. Born and Haber analyzed this and realized that you could imagine that this overall process was made up of individual steps. The first step uh, depicted here shows a change within that chemical system in which in this first step you're going from lithium in the solid phase to lithium in the gas phase. So after the first step here's what the chemical system looks like. You've got lithium atoms in the gas phase, the fluorine is still in the form of these diatomic molecules. So in the second step, we're going from this chemical system to the next state that it's in, in which you've got both lithium atoms in the gas phase plus individual fluorine atoms in the gas phase. So to get from here to here, you had to break the bonds in this one half of a mole of fluorine you know, and get with a full mole of fluorine atoms. In the next step, Step, we go from this in this system we basically remove an electron from each of the lithium atoms basically ionize those metal atoms okay and of course that requires energy so that's again it's an uphill to change the state of that chemical system like that one more by that one change then in the next step Oh, we basically transfer that electron, which is removed from the lithium atom, to the fluorine atom to produce the fluoride ion. So that next, that energy associated with step four corresponds to the first activate electron affinity of fluorine. In principle, if somehow you could take this chemical system and push it through these nice clean processes. Then to form the ionic compound you would have to take these ions which are depicted here now which were well separated in the gas phase and let them come together under their electrostatic attractions for one another to form a lattice. And Then you would go and end up in this final state. So not only today is this a really fantastic thought exercise to sort of go through or process to envision um, for chemistry students. This has been a very useful tool to allow chemists to estimate the energies of lattice formation, which are often very large. And nearly impossible to measure directly because it's very hard to get ions in the gas phase and then in any controlled way watch those ions in the gas phase form a lattice. But it's possible 
for chemists to know all these these other energies. The overall enthalpy of a formation of an ionic compound can be measured by, say, something like calorimetry, which you will learn about in the second half of general chemistry at Georgia Southern, if you're here. So the energy of basically getting those metal atoms into the gas phase is known. The energy of breaking the half bond of the half mole of fluorine-fluorine bonds is known. The first ionization energy for the metal is known. The first electron affinity for the non-metal, the fluorine, is known. And so from a knowledge of these energies, you can calculate the unknown. That's the utility of the Born-Haber cycle. Here again is the Born-Haber cycle for lithium fluoride. Now this looks a little cleaner than the last slide that we looked at because those images have been removed. Those images were just for teaching purposes to help you envision all the things that were happening, happening to the chemical system of the lithium and fluorine atoms as you went through these various processes. So now here, this Born-Haber cycle, I've added numbers which I got from a reference book, um, reference numbers for the energies associated with various these various processes. The overall enthalpy of formation of lithium fluoride is known, as is the enthalpy of vaporizing one mole of lithium. This is the first ionization energy, which is known. This is the energy that it would require to break half of a mole of fluorine-fluorine bonds. Anyway, all these energies are known. But we can ask a question now, from a knowledge of these other energies, which are measurable, um, what is the enthalpy of lattice formation for lithium fluoride, which is very difficult to measure? Can we use the Born-Haber cycle to calculate that? Well, yes. Basically, you can look at this like, you know, <laughs> this distance up you know, is a con you know is the same on both sides. So if we add up these energies, they have to equal to the sum of these energies. You might want to be careful with your signs when you're working with these calculations. Basically, say I've put this electron affinity energy in here as a positive number, um, but in reality, when that occurs, it releases it releases energy. And we can calculate this unknown simply by adding up all these energies and subtract and um, subtracting that one. 1037 kilojoules per mole, which is the highest lattice energy that we saw previously on that um, comparison of different ionic compounds. So here are some more sample questions. These are the upcoming questions are more qualitative. I'll give you a second to read this, pause your video, think of your answer, and then I'll indicate the answer. Here's another one. What energy is step four associated with in the Born-Haber cycle for the formation of potassium fluoride? Again, read it over, pause your video if you need to, really read this. You should really try if you're trying to learn this. Now here's the next question. Which energy is associated with step six? Not all Born-Haber cycles are equally simple. The Born-Haber cycle that you've seen so far in this video is among one of the simplest Born-Haber cycles that there is. But cycles will be more complex having more steps if you're dealing with an ionic compound in which the metal ion has a greater than a one positive charge in which case if there's more than one electron removed from the metal you have to add up the energies associated with the first second and or third ionization of the metal you have to know all those ionization energies and then they will be appearing as separate steps. And similarly, if you're dealing with an ionic compound in which the non-metal ion has a greater than one minus charge, multiple electron affinity steps are needed. Let's look at one here. This is a Born-Haber cycle for magnesium chloride in which magnesium 
ions have a two positive charge. Things look very much the same. If you started with solid magnesium metal, you'd have to evaporate it, but then to, you know, and, and you'd also need to break the bonds in, actually in this case, a mole of chlorine molecules. Break that mole of chlorine molecules into two moles of chlorine atoms in the gas phase, because one mole of the magnesium chloride solid on a compound has two moles of chlorine atoms, chloride ions actually, um, within it. Okay, and then you would have to ionize that magnesium not just once to Mg plus, but twice to go all the way to Mg2 plus. So there's two ionization related steps in the Bornhaber cycle here. So the first and second ionization energies. Everything else kind of looks the same here. There's the step for the adding the single electron to each of each chlorine atom within two moles of chlorine atoms. So it's a little more complicated. Now let's look at another one for Na2O. Here you've got sodium ions with one positive charge. So there's just one ionization step needed for those. But here the oxygens have O2 minus charge, which if we totally break this down into like the theoretically envisioned Born-Haber cycle, you start with these oxygen atoms and you add two electrons to them. In steps though, if you have the stepwise electron affinity energies. So in the first step, you add one electron to go from O to O minus. Then you add the second electron to go from O minus to O2 minus. You may notice that, whereas you get energy out when you add the first electron to oxygen atom in the gas phase, it takes energy to add the second electron to it. The fact of the second electron affinity is positive it has a lot to do with the fact that you're you're starting with an ion that's already negatively charged and you're trying to add a negatively charged electron to it so the ion and the electron repel each other so you kind of have to provide energy to make those two come together and the electron stick to the oxygen although it was endothermic it took energy to form the o2 minus ion you then fortunately get a whole bunch of energy out as the lattice forms. And you have a large lattice energy because, because of the anions having a 2 minus charge. Thanks for watching. That brings me to the end of this second video in my discussion of the energetics of ionic compound formation. Thanks for watching. Thanks for learning.